Good morning, little church on the hill. This is uh, Gravel Ridge General Baptist Church. Um, our address is 15914 Highway 107. We ask everybody, uh, we please invite anybody to come that so wishes. We just ask that they be prepared to listen to the Word of God and receive His love. Um, so today we've got a um, story here. Boy, Mr. Ronnie's breaking out the good stuff today. A story of redemption. So I always, I always like to begin my messages with a little illustration. Sometimes it helps me get my point. Sometimes I'll read the illustration and that might um, be what, in, what inspires a whole message. You know, or it might be I've got a message and then we're, we're looking back. And, but anyways, I've got a, 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 you know, and I also like to, you know, there's a lot of great the, theologians, or what's the proper word? Theologians. <laughs> Theologians. I never... Uh, said I was a great speaker, but anyways, there's a lot of great people, a lot of great commentaries and stuff that you can read from and stuff, so um, I pull one here from a, from a gentleman named Johnny Cash. He had wrote an article, Johnny Cash once did an album called American Recordings. On the album cover is a picture of two dogs. One dog is, is black with a white stripe, the other dog is white with a black stripe. The two dogs are meant to say something about Johnny Cash. In an interview with Rolling Stones, Cash explains what the two dogs mean. Their names are Sin, and the other one's name is Redemption. Sin is the black one with the white stripe. Redemption is the white one with the black stripe. That's the kind of the theme of that album for me, he said. When I was really bad, well, I was not all bad. When I was trying to be good, I could never be all good. There would be that black streak going through me. No one is all bad, he said. No one is all good. But we are all sinners who need to be redeemed. We all need Jesus. Now, before Jesus could ascend back to heaven, he had some unfinished business to take care of. He needed to prop somebody back up. He needed to lift them up, lift their spirits up, right? He needed to pull them out of the depths of despair. He needed to restore their confidence in their self. So if you have your Bible, um, you can turn to John 21, John chapter 21. Um, I'm going to be reading through this scripture, but I'll be referencing some other scriptures on the screen. And if you don't have your Bible, you can listen to me speak. But So John chapter 21 it says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. It says in verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Hey, our Savior's gone, our Messiah's gone, everything's going over with, I'm going fishing, they said. Then they told him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and once again they fished all night and caught nothing. So Peter went back to what he knew. He reverted back to old habits. His story of hope, his witnessing of miracles, his time with his mentor, his teacher, his friend, is all over, he thought. You know, the last time he saw Jesus, it was not pleasant. Jesus was being drug away. I'm, I'm sure Peter felt he, like he let Jesus down, right? He's down in the dumps about this. He might even be reliving the scene in his head, possibly. So what do we do when we're dealt with a hard blow in life? Do we revert back to old ways? Things that used to, do we used to lean on for comfort? Do we fall back on stuff that used to give us temporary relief? It might have been gambling, unhealthy relationships, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is. Maybe it's just pushing people away. I don't want to deal with nobody. I don't want to get close to nobody. Maybe it's just destructive behavior. But here is the future rock of the Christian church down in the dumps. He reverted back to old habits. Once again, they fished all night with no luck. And then somebody from shore tells him, cast your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find fish there. 
They did that and then they pulled their nets out. Their nets were full. Then they realized that Jesus is the one on the shore talking to them. And then you look at verse 7, it says, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment and plunged into the sea. He couldn't wait for the boat to get there. He's just going. Jesus, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then we go to verse 12. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. This is the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And then in verse 15, Jesus says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my babies, or feed my lambs, I'm sorry. Simon Peter, do you love me more than these things? More than this former life you lived? More than these old things that gave you comfort? Do you love me more than these things of the world, Simon Peter? When Jesus asked this question, I was wondering what, what was going through Peter's mind when Jesus asked him this. These are just possible scenarios that I think of. I read this story, I study this, it's a personal story for me because I have fumbled the ball so much in my life I can sympathize with Peter. So what, what could have gone through Jesus, I mean Peter's mind when he's asking him this? Could have been that, that time after, after the Last Supper, Jesus is going to the garden to prepare himself for what he knows is coming up. He goes for a walk with some of the disciples, Peter, John, and James, to pray. Jesus was preparing himself for what he was about to endure. He was in agony. He told the disciples to pray against temptation. And then Jesus goes off a little ways and to pray. Jesus goes back to check on him. What's Peter doing? He's asleep. Jesus, last night before his crucifixion, Peter's supposed to be praying and he's asleep. Do you think that's what Peter was thinking about? I'll let Jesus down. Or was it something Jesus told him earlier in that night? Luke 22, 31 through 32 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So he said, Simon, Simon, the devil has, Satan has asked, may he sift you. May he work you over, separate you, separate the good from the bad. Satan wants to expose our weaknesses. He wants us to see, he wants us to see these weaknesses and start feeling bad. He wants us to start feeling unworthy. He wants you to see your faults and not what you do good at. That's his number one goal. But then Jesus tells him, but I have prayed for you. Jesus is always praying for us, no matter what. Jesus is telling him throughout this sifting, he would be praying for him. Just like he prays for all of us when we're being sifted. Jesus is praying through our faults. As long as we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he is praying for us. On our part. And he says, strengthen your brethren. Strengthen your brethren. You will be the rock. You will be the symbol of redemption for my church. You will be responsible for your brothers in Jesus Christ. You will need to encourage them and show them what they can overcome if they follow Jesus. Be a walking ambassador 
of Jesus Christ. And then we went back to John. We looked at, if we look in verse 16, he said to him once again, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Simply, Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you have faith in me? Do you entrust me with your care? Do, do you think when Jesus said this to Peter, Peter could have been thinking, you know, I was the first disciple to recognize and call Jesus the Messiah. Or do you think Peter could have been thinking how courageous he was in the presence of Jesus? He was able to walk on water in the presence of Jesus. He was ready to defend Jesus in the garden with the high priest and all the other people, the officials. He had the sword. He cut the guy's ear off. I guarantee he was going for his head. The guy probably got lucky. He was ready to fight to the death at that moment. He was ready, no matter what, in the presence of Jesus to defend and protect Jesus. But when Peter, when Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, when he was walking on the water, he sank. When Peter was by himself, he started getting afraid. And a certain servant girl, in Luke chapter 22, 56 through 57 tells us, and a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, this man was also with him. All of a sudden, here's this great Peter. He's ready to just a few hours before take somebody's head off, and he's scared of a little girl. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Everything he had witnessed and been through the last three years, and he denies Jesus. Now, without Jesus, Peter is afraid. This rough, tough fisherman is nothing more than a scaredy cat. He has tucked his tail and he's hiding out. He's hiding from his problems. He doesn't want to face the world. Now we go to verse 17 in John. And he says one more time, he says, He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him, the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. He asked him again, do you love me? Jesus has given Peter an opportunity to feel assurance, to help him realize that he does love Jesus. Peter already knew, Jesus already knew that he loved him. Jesus was trying to get Peter to realize he does love him. He still has the faith in him. He still has greatness in him. Jesus is trying to pick him up out of the dumps. Peter knew, Jesus already knew the answer. But Jesus was concerned for Peter. So do you think about, do you think Peter was thinking about the three times he ultimately denied Jesus and what happened next? I don't know him. Go on, man. I don't know him. He knows him. He speaks like him. I don't know him. Y'all are crazy. And then what happens next? And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. I think more at that moment, this is my interpretation, I think more than uh, Peter thinking about himself denying Jesus three times, I think it was the look on Jesus' face. When Peter looked, I mean, when Jesus looked at him, I think it was the look on Jesus' face. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So what do you think that look on Jesus' face was? Disbelief? 
I can't believe you just denied me. I was just, I didn't, you didn't have to, just because I told you you would, don't mean you have to do it. Was it bafflement? I'm, I just can't believe you did this. Was it displeasure or resentment? Peter, what were you thinking? Was it a look of anguish? Why did you deny me, Peter? Why did you deny me? Was it bitterness or hatred? You better be glad they are holding me back because I'm coming for you. Or maybe it was a look of pity, a look of sympathy. Maybe it was a look of concern or a comforted look. It will be okay. That silent look you give to somebody, you want to make things better for them, but there's nothing you can do. Maybe it was a look of, of compassion like a parent has for their children when they are facing a problem. And there's nothing you can do to help them but be there to comfort them, to be compassionate for them. Jesus knew, Jesus knew what Peter, what Peter knew what Jesus was about to go face. Jesus knew what he was about to go face. And still Jesus had a look of compassion on his face to Peter. Peter, it's going to be okay. Jesus had compassion for Peter. He was showing compassion for Peter. He is restoring Peter. He's restoring his confidence. He's not restoring his confidence in private. He's doing this right now. Ask him three times in front of everybody. He's restoring him in front of his fellow disciples. Jesus is helping Peter see that he still loves him. And then he goes to tell him in, in um, verse 18. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But you, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And he tells him in verse 19, this he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he said, when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Jesus tells him, you will have redemption. Don't worry. Your death is going to glorify God. We will, at some point in time, you can put money on it, we are going to turn our back on Jesus. We're going to deny them. You can put money on that. But if you are a Christian, you will have an opportunity to glorify God. This is why the devil wants to sift you. He wants to expose your weaknesses. He wants you to see, you want, he wants you to be in despair, unhappiness. He wants you to feel bad about yourself. He wants you to feel unworthy. He wants you to think there's no hope. I've, I've gone past the point. There is no hope. But these are the instances that God uses to glorify him. These are the instances God uses to show others his glory. Shows others that there is grace waiting on you. There is peace waiting on you. There is joy. There's happiness. There's confidence. But then he says one thing here on the bottom. He says, follow me. Now here's another time he, he, he told him the same thing. Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 19. And Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You will become great in the kingdom of God. Jesus' very first words to Peter were, follow me. Have faith in me. Trust me to lead you down the right path. Let me help you. Here's my hand. Follow me. Let me go back to John in verse 22. Peter asked about, what, what about John? How will he die? Will he be glorified? Will he, you know, what kind of death is he going to have? And right here in verse 22, Jesus said to him, 
If I will that he remain till I come, what is it to you? Then he tells him, here's the most important part of this whole scripture to me. You follow me. Jesus' first and last words to Peter were, follow me. Right now, he's commanded him, you follow me. I have great plans for you. This is what Jesus wants from all of us, to follow him. He wants us to accept him, trust him, and let him into our life. He knows what we have and we'll mess up like Peter, but all Jesus wants is for us to follow him. Now let's back up just a little bit to what Jesus went through before this time. What he went through so we could all be forgiven of our sins and have a pathway to eternal life. I found a description I'll read that kind of sums up in a modern take kind of what Jesus went through. It says, remember, and this is Rick Warren from his, one of his books. It says, remember what God has already done for you. If God never did anything else for you, he would still deserve your continual praise for the rest of your life because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Unfortunately, we forget the cruel details of the agonizing sacrifice God made on our behalf. Being familiar breeds complacency. Even before his crucifixion, the Son of God was stripped naked, beaten until almost unrecognizable, whipped, scorned, mocked, crowned with thorns, and spit on continually. Abused and ridiculed by heartless men, he was treated worse than an animal. Then nearly unconscious from blood loss, he was forced to drag a cumbersome cross up a hill, was nailed to it, and then was left to die the slow, excruciating torture of death by crucifixion. While his life blood drained out, Heckler stood by and shouted insults, mocking fun of his pain and challenging his claim to be God. Next, as Jesus took all of mankind's sin and guilt on himself, God looked away from that ugly sight and Jesus cried out in total desperation, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus could have simply saved himself, but then he could not have saved us. Words cannot truly describe the darkness of that moment. Now I want to back up a little bit more. So the night before he was crucified, Jesus and the disciples gathered together. The Last Supper, right? Jesus washed their feet. They come in. They broke bread. And Paul tells us about what the Lord revealed to him about that night. First Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 24 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed and took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat this, my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They were having the first communion that night, just like we will be having here in a little bit. He said, take this bread and eat it in remembrance of the sacrifice I made for you, the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, what he went through, the love he showed for us. He paid the ultimate price for us to be saved. Remember that. Remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. And then verse 25. It says, In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This cup is symbolic of the new covenant that we have. We went from 633 laws to two. We have an abundance of grace when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have been redeemed. 
we have been restored by Jesus just like Peter has. No matter how much we've rejected him, spit on his face, he still loves us and wants to be our Lord and Savior. He always has the door open for us. He loves us. We take communion, as Scripture says, in remembrance of Jesus. Then Paul goes on to give gives us some more instructions before accepting communion. He says, Anyone who eats his bread or drinks his cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. We do this to honor Jesus, to remember Jesus, what he did for us. This is a sacred act for Christians. It's not fun and games. This is an act of commemorating Jesus. This is part of receiving the gift Jesus has given to us. If you're not truly a follower of Jesus Christ, I wouldn't take it. If you have doubts about Jesus, if you're doubting if He's truly your Savior, if you're doubting if He is the Messiah, if you're really just not quite sure, I wouldn't take it. If you're only going to do it because the person beside you is saying you need to do it, but you don't want to do it, don't take it. We're not judgmental here. If you have any other uh, reason to take it, other than remembrance of Jesus, His sacrifice, the new covenant He's made with us, don't take it. Once again, we're not judgmental people. If you don't feel comfortable taking it, don't take it. If there is anything you need to work out with God, now's the time. Ask everybody to stand. We're going to take a moment to examine ourselves, to examine our heart. None of us are truly worthy in the sense of worthy. We all sin. That's why Jesus died for us. But we need to examine ourselves to make sure we are doing this for the right purpose, the right reason. That we're doing this because we love Jesus Christ more than anything else. We want to do this as an act of remembrance. Just take some time. If you need to come to the altar, come to the altar. If you want to pray in place, pray in place.